David, we should have stand still on some of our major highways. We'll have a lot of hazardous waste for the moon, all right? A few years ago, a videographer came to Providence House to capture the story of Letitia. When I watched the first edit of the video, I asked him, why didn't you ask her to tell you the story about why she needed our services? And he said, I assumed you didn't want me to reinforce the stereotype about moms like that. I was shocked because she was a black single mom who had a bulging belly. He assumed he knew her story. He didn't have the first clue. Letitia's real story is that bump in her stomach was a cancerous mass. And she brought her children to Providence House so that we could watch them while she was hospitalized to receive radiation treatments. She came to us not even knowing if she was going to live to tell her story. That is one of hundreds of untold stories that Providence House is committed to telling this community. We know these stories. We have helped over 7,000 children and moms like Letitia for the last 34 years. We are Ohio's first crisis nursery, protecting children newborn through 10 years old who are at risk of abuse and neglect. We provide emergency shelter and crisis care services to children like a four-year-old who was hungry most of his life, who learned that he doesn't have to eat until he vomits or hide food for his baby sister to be fed, or 14-month-old twins who learn how to sit and walk after they've lived in carriers because their homeless mother had nowhere safe to lay them down. And what about that mom? We help her too. We empower parents, mostly single moms, and offer services to help them break through the multi-generational cycles of poverty and violence and system involvement. Our moms love their children, but they are in desperate situations with no one to turn to and no safety net to catch them. Often, all they need is intervention from a program like ours to be pulled back from the brink. We teach them to be the nurturing parent they never had. We connect them to services to address their own wellness and stability. And we hold them accountable for taking control of their lives and their family's future. Most of our parents weren't parented. They grew up on the streets, in violent homes, with unsafe caregivers, in foster care. They didn't have a choice about who they were born to and the kind of environments they grew up in. Like a mom that we helped, Teresa, who was battling the vicious cycle of violence, poverty, and addiction. Her own mother was a drug addict who had violent boyfriends that abused her. She was placed in foster care and bounced from house to house to house. She was a teen parent. She battled alcoholism and depression and had a host of health issues. At 25, she found herself with a new baby, and she wanted to make the choice to change her life. She brought her children to Providence House and began the hard work of becoming the parent and the person that she wanted to be. Today, she's sober, her mental health is stable, she has a job, and she's raising her two children on her own. I wish that I could tell you that Teresa's story before coming to Providence House was unique. It's not. In the most developed countries in the world, children at risk of abuse or neglect are suffering. There is so much research about the impact of trauma and violence on children that almost to the birthday, we can tell you what's gonna happen to them while they grow up. According to the Harvard Center for the Developing Child, Chronic stress, the toxic stress of kids who grow up in crisis will stay with them for the rest of their lives, affecting their development, their health, and their education. There are so many studies and stats about children in crisis, from UNICEF's global analysis on child well-being to the Kaiser ACEs study on health outcomes. And when you take all of this research and you put it together over the timeline of a child who's been maltreated, a grim timeline begins to form over their lifespan. We know 
that these children will have lower IQs and be likely to drop out of high school. We know that they'll be violent youths, more likely to use drugs and alcohol, and be teen parents. We also know that they'll be involved in criminal activity and diagnosed with mental health issues. As adults, they're more likely to be homeless and unemployed and to abuse their own children. And their own health is affected. Obesity, diabetes, 50% greater chance of having heart disease and cancer. And they will die 20 years earlier than their nurtured peers. Why does this story keep repeating itself? Poverty is one of the most significant causes for these kinds of outcomes. And even the people that are trying to break through are often trapped by the very systems that we believe are helping them. Moms like Tunisia, who often went to the food pantry with her two little girls, and more than once heard someone say, why don't they just stop having all of these children? They shouldn't be allowed to have children unless they can take care of them. She was one of so many working poor in our community who couldn't afford food after she paid rent and utilities and childcare. So what is the story on working poor? We've heard the term. You probably assume the story is simply they should get better jobs and earn more money. It's not that simple. Being working poor isn't just being hungry and broke. It's actually a very complicated mathematical equation based on federal income guidelines and the number of people in your household. Most poor people don't even understand it, let alone how to get out of it. In the most developed countries across the world, the single largest populations of people who live in poverty are women and children. In fact, the US ranks second last in global poverty for children, only behind Romania. From census data, we know that nearly half of the Clevelanders who live in poverty are women with children. And worse, 42% of those children will remain there for the rest of their lives. How do they get stuck there? One of the biggest issues is what's called the benefits cliff. The US lags far behind most developed countries in its services for working poor women with children. In fact, US women with children are eligible, if they're working poor, for benefits for health care, child care, rental assistance, utilities, but only if they don't earn too much. How much is too much? Remember Tunisia and her daughters at the food pantry? She worked with a cleaning service and she made almost $20,000 a year. $20,000 a year for a family of three. She was receiving assistance for daycare, rent, food. She was making it barely, and then she got a raise. She was making $12 an hour. That's about $25,000 a year. Good for her, she's doing better, right? No, that raise disqualified her for all of those benefits that were keeping her afloat. She now had to pay out of pocket for everything and was actually taking home less money than when she was working poor. She got fired from her job because she couldn't show up to work because she couldn't pay daycare and had to stay home and watch her daughters. Her unemployment led to eviction because she couldn't pay rent. And Tunisia, like so many other working poor families, spiraled back into homelessness, hunger, and even deeper poverty. It's not like Tunisia wants to raise her children in poverty. Poverty is a state of the pocketbook. It is not a state of mind. In fact, in, as we look at what happens, why, why do we know that these families, these moms, need this kind of help? It's easy to assume that these are bad parents who've made bad choices, and it couldn't be further from the truth. These are women who have been victimized and marginalized their entire lives, and now are trying to raise children on their own. 
How do we know this? At Providence House, we screen almost 300 children and 200 parents for their exposure to violence and trauma before they come to us. Our results are pretty scary. 50% of the women and children we serve have been victims of violent crime and trauma. Worse, 60% of children in the United States and in our own county under the age of 18 will be witnesses or victims of crime. Pretty startling. The story gets worse. A UNICEF study of child well-being globally ranks the U.S. in the bottom four for child well-being and infant mortality. One of the richest, most developed countries in the world, and our babies are dying at one of the highest rates across the globe. Ohio, we're third in the nation, and Cleveland is the second worst across the United States for infant mortality. So what happens to the children who survive? Three million U.S. children are investigated for abuse and neglect every year. And 2,000 of them are killed, most before their second birthday. I want to frame this story for you another way. In the first 10 years of the Afghanistan war, 2,000 U.S. military gave up their lives. At the same period, 20 thousand American children were killed in their homes on American soil by a family member. Where is our horror at these statistics? Why are we as a nation not talking about this? This creates a huge social and financial burden for our community. These issues affect our economy's workforce, economics, safety and sustainability for generations if we don't prevent it. The U.S. spends over $80 billion a year on child abuse and neglect. Ohio is over $4 million a year. And we know that just one maltreated child will cost all of us, one, will cost all of us over $200,000 in their lifetime. The math is simple. Last year, 30,000 Ohio children were substantiated as victims of abuse and neglect. Over $600 million is going to be spent just on last year's class. And this year's class is waiting in the wings. So if we know all of this data about women and children in poverty, and the impact of violence and trauma in their lives, and the, the huge, the unbelievable costs in human and social and economic capital, why isn't it getting better? If their lives are so bad, why are these women not telling their stories and getting help? For one thing, they have no one to turn to, nobody that they really trust that will be safe for their children. They're also terrified that if they step forward and they ask for help, they're on the radar and their children will be taken away from them. What's their alternative? Leaving their children alone? Leaving them in the care of somebody unsafe? Losing them to foster care? Where can they go? Who can they turn to? In this community, we're blessed. They can come to Providence House. They can find a place that's the family they can trust, where their babies are kept safe and their families are kept together. Our moms choose to change their stories. They choose to do the hard work to become safe, stable parents and build homes for their children. They choose to make a big sacrifice, leaving their children with us while they work to get their lives together. And it works. 98% of our children are reunified with their parent following services at Providence House. 
That represents over $15 million in savings in this community every year. More importantly, 300 children are back home with their mommies. We must, as a community, begin to approach families in crisis in a two-generation model to support and stabilize and empower caregivers while also supporting programs for healthy child development. One without the other does not work. We must challenge the policies that are limiting our families' abilities to succeed. And we have to battle the assumptions that we are making about women and children in crisis. We have to stop creating fiction and tell the real stories about these women and children. Providence Health has thousands of untold stories that without us could have been one of the tragedies that we read about in the news. But we know we can change those stories and we are changing those stories from the letters and the cards and the school pictures and the report cards and the graduation invitations that we get from moms who've succeeded and want to celebrate with us by sharing where their children have gone. Moms like Sandy, who came to Providence House with a van full of donated items from a baby shower at her office. She was crying and she told us, 20 years ago when that door opened, I was an addict at rock bottom. You took care of my baby and you helped me find treatment. I've been clean ever since and I raised my daughter to be a wonderful woman. I didn't tell anybody in my office why I did this donation drive but I swore that someday I was gonna pay you back for saving my life and helping me keep my baby. Those are the stories of our women and children. We know that children can be protected. We know that families can be safely restored. And we know that the cycles of poverty and violence and abuse can be stopped. I know because I met a very successful young man named Bobby who came to Providence House to donate a big fire truck to us. And he told me, I lived here when I was five. I was here for two months and I had my fifth birthday party here. It was the first birthday party I had in my life. And I never forgot that people were hugging me and kissing me and it was the first time in my life that someone said, I love you. On behalf of our families and children, thank you. <laughs>